In the time since we last spoke, we've learned a lot, but we still have a lot of questions. So some of the things we know so far are as follows. We know that there was a single event of the virus being transmitted from a wild bird into dairy cattle in Texas. We know that some of those cows who were healthy at the time, not showing any clinical signs, moved up to Michigan, where they did start to show signs of high path avian influenza and were subsequently tested and confirmed to be positive. We know that the virus is spread within herds and across herds within Michigan and other states. We also know that that virus somehow made its way into our commercial poultry operations as well. Understanding how that happened is complex and there are a lot of people working on answering that question. We also know that cows, when they are infected with high path avian influenza, especially in those first couple weeks of infection, create a lot of virus in the milk. The good news is that pasteurization kills the virus, so we know that our milk supply, our dairy supply is safe. To help get at answering some of the questions we don't understand, our lab is working closely with USDA, MDARD, and specifically our state veterinarian and her team, as well as faculty in the College of Veterinary Medicine's Large Animal Clinical Sciences. Together, we're working with farmers and producers who have affected herds to be able to go back and continually collect samples from individual animals. This allows us to get a better understanding of how long a cow may be shedding virus, whether it's in the milk, confirming that we're not seeing any evidence of viral shed through the feces, and looking even in nasal swabs to see if there's any indication that they might be shedding from their respiratory tract. To date, what we know is that the virus seems to be happiest in the mammary glands, and we're finding it primarily in the milk. And the reason that's important is because we're trying to understand how the virus is getting in the environment and may be moving from one animal to another. So the more we understand about ways it could potentially be leaving one animal, the better we can understand what the risk factors are for infection of another animal. New testing requirements have been put in place through a federal order. So for example, any lactating cow that's moving from Michigan to another state or from another state back into Michigan is tested before it comes here to really reduce the risk of spreading the virus further. One of the ways we detect new herds in a couple of different ways. One is if cows start to show clinical signs that drop in milk production. So that's one way to detect a positive herd. And our farmers and producers are working closely with their veterinarians here in Michigan to recognize any sort of change in their animals and submitting samples for testing, allowing us to rapidly identify that as a positive herd. And I think this is an opportunity to give a shout out to those people for being so on guard. So we're catching this as early as possible. I think it's important to understand that when we talk about the high pack avian influenza outbreak currently, it's more than our dairy cattle. Because the more virus there is in the environment, the more risk there is for continued spread. Whether that is spill back into wild birds, whether it's infection of other animal species, whether those are domestic poultry or barn cats. In addition to the obvious concerns for animal health and welfare, the other reason that that's so important is that as long as the virus continues to circulate in high levels in different animal populations, the more likely there is to be new mutations. And these new mutations may change how the virus behaves, not just in our dairy cattle, for example, but potentially changing how it may be able to spread to additional species, including to people. And again, we today, with the laboratory capabilities that we have, every single animal that tests positive for high path avian influenza, that sample gets analyzed by its sequence so that we're looking in every single animal to see whether or not there are any potential changes that are of concern that would change the overall risk level. To date, we haven't seen anything, but this is something where we will continue to dedicate a lot of resources and efforts.